Today on Bridge City News, Virginia Beach police have identified the shooter who killed 12 people yesterday afternoon inside a municipal building. Canada remains committed to ratifying the new NAFTA deal with the U.S. regardless of President Donald Trump's threat to impose new tariffs. And hundreds turned out for the annual Lethbridge Hike for Life in support of the rights of the unborn. Your nation. Your province. Your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Paul Arthur. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Police have released the name of the man who opened fire at his workplace yesterday afternoon in Virginia Beach, killing 12 people. 40-year-old Dwayne Craddock was an engineer with the city, and he entered a municipal government building going through three floors, shooting indiscriminately. The 15-year employee got into an extended gun battle with police before he was killed. The man's neighbors described him as quiet and rarely smiling. The shootings have deeply impacted city workers. I'm just going through a lot of emotion because it's too, way too much killing going on and I'm just glad that they alerted us in enough time so we wouldn't be outside when everything was occurring. So I'm happy about that but I'm still shaken because it's just entirely too much killing going on. We heard shooting, we heard shooting but we didn't think it was that close that close like in proximity of the building so i just thank god that they were able to alert us in time because if it had been 10 minutes more we all would have been outside so that's what i'm grateful for today they they told us all clear you're perfectly safe to leave the shooter has been apprehended i'm sure they couldn't give us any more than that but that was enough to make me feel safe enough to come outside and to know that God was with us and is with us. Hundreds gathered today at Henderson Lake Park in Lethbridge for the annual Hike for Life. The event, which was hosted by Lethbridge and District Pro-Life, raises over $40,000 each year towards education and programs that support the rights of the unborn. Dwayne Kanannenbelt says the event is not about protesting, but celebrating. So this is a day when we come together and we just recognize the value of life. And so we have families and kids and all people who think that people have value come together and we celebrate life. There's food, there's games, there's music, and uh, we just want it to be a great time for families to come together who are like-minded on this issue. One of the great programs that we're excited about is the start of Elsie's House. People will start hearing radio ads about that in the coming weeks. It's a place where women and families who are in crisis can go and live and receive education and training so that uh, they can become good parents and find independence in their living. Families, youth and adults came out to Sports Fest today for the opportunity to try out a wide variety of activities at the Service Sports Center. Lethbridge Sport Council Executive Director Susan Iman says the event promotes sports and active living. We want to connect the community to sport organizations to all the programming that's happening in Lethbridge with regards to active recreation, physical literacy and sport. We want to promote the programs that sport organizations have to the community. There are so many sports in Lethbridge that people just aren't aware of. And for those who would rather engage in a more relaxing sport, the Lethbridge Horseshoe Club is now holding tournaments over the weekends at Henderson Lake Park. Club spokesperson Dave Burr says anyone can play. You can uh, go to any tournament at any level and you play against people at your own level of pitching. So if you, if you were a beginner and you, and you played in three tournaments in a year, you could even go and play in the world tournament. Calgary has a club, Medicine Hat has a club, we have a club. Uh, there's several clubs in the, around the Red Deer area, there's several clubs around there and we have um, tournaments almost one every weekend. The Lethbridge Horseshoe Club is in its 45th year of operation. The Bent 8 Car Club hosted their third annual show and shine at the Pure Casino today. The club is a group of Southern Alberta hot rod enthusiasts and the name is derived from the 50s slang term for a V8 engine. Vehicles from as far back as the 20s were on display as well as vendors, food and live entertainment.
Crews battling more than two dozen wildfires in northern Alberta are hoping Mother Nature will help them out over the weekend. As there is some rain in the forecast, over 10,000 people have been forced from their homes and at least one oil company has been forced to shut down some operations. The town of Slave Lake has been placed under an eight-hour evacuation alert. The military will be helping with airlifts for evacuees, transporting supplies and medical assistance. Meanwhile, officials in northern Ontario are monitoring a fire that's forced hundreds of people to leave the Pikanjikum First Nation. A major forest fire just east of the Flying community has prompted a state of emergency and a massive evacuation effort. The Ontario and federal governments say they are working together to get hundreds of people off the reserve. The Canadian Armed Forces used three Hercules aircraft for evacuations yesterday. BC's minimum wage got a $1.20 raise today, boosting it to $13.85. But some say it's still too low. Laird Cronk, president of the BC Federation of Labour, says the increase will help the province's lowest paid workers, but they will still be on poverty level wages. This is the second of four annual increases that will take effect on June 1st of each year. An online ticket resale site says tickets for the next Toronto Raptors game against the Golden State Warriors are a relative bargain compared to Game 1 of the NBA Final. StubHub says the series is shaping up to be the most popular NBA Final it's ever seen. With ticket sales through the site up 57% from last year, it says the most expensive ticket it sold for Thursday's Game 1 of the series went for $23,000. So far, tickets for Game 2 on Sunday night are going for a mere 10 grand. What a deal. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau spoke to the FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, gathering in Quebec City yesterday to reaffirm his government's commitment to working with communities amid turmoil in relationship with provinces. Trudeau says the actions of provincial conservative governments show how far they are willing to go to pursue small government ideology. Across the country, we've seen how municipalities have been left out of conversations that directly affect them. We've seen provinces cut services without talking to you, services that you deliver. In some cases, politicians have gone out of their way to block federal funding that was promised to your communities just to score political points. What we've seen at the provincial level should serve as a reminder and a cautionary tale. We can't forget how far conservative politicians will go to fulfill their smaller government ideology. Federal Conservative leader Andrew Scheer also spoke at the FCM meeting, returning the favour, taking a shot at the Liberals, while highlighting the Conservatives' plans for working together with municipalities. I find even more worrisome that the whole federal infrastructure spending under this government has been hopelessly mismanaged. It was astounding, for example, to hear the Parliamentary Budget Officer say in 2018 that the infrastructure plan simply, quote, does not exist. Think about that for an instant. The independent expert Parliamentary Budget Officer said that the government does not have a plan to manage a $188 billion program. And I commit today that as leader of a Conservative government, I will not only work collaboratively with provinces, but with municipalities too. We'll listen to their needs and treat them as partners. I will also maintain the needed and agreed upon levels of infrastructure spending, provide certainty and stability on funding levels to manage taxpayers money carefully and respectfully. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland says Canada and Mexico are committed to ratifying the new NAFTA with the U.S. regardless of President Donald Trump's threat to impose tariffs on all Mexican imports in response to the flow of refugees crossing into the U.S. She indicates that Canada won't get involved in what she calls a bilateral issue between Mexico and the U.S. Canada's position continues to be the one we outlined right after the 232 steel and aluminum tariffs were lifted and that is that we are now ready to proceed with ratification of NAFTA here in Canada and as Canadians know we began that process this week. Of course the new NAFTA will enter into force 
only upon ratification in all three countries. Let me just emphasize that this border issue between Mexico and the United States is a bilateral issue. At least 29 people have been injured as fire engulfed a migrant center in the northwest corner of Bosnia early this morning. Local media aired video footage showing people jumping from windows as thick gray smoke poured from the building. The cause of the fire was not immediately known. The camp hosts hundreds of migrants hoping to make it to Western Europe. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, Virginia Beach police have identified the shooter who killed 12 people yesterday afternoon inside a municipal building, although they say they will mention his name only once. And a look at weekend weather. The lingering smoke from wildfires continues to cause poor air quality in southern Alberta. There is a risk of a thunderstorm this evening. However, we should have clear skies overnight with a low of 11. For tomorrow, sunshine and an unseasonable high of 30 degrees. Along with that comes the risk of an afternoon thunderstorm. How welcome is freedom of speech in Canadian colleges and universities? Not so much, according to lawyer John Carpe, president of the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms. Hal Roberts has that interview straight ahead. But first, here's a look at what's happening in and around your community. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. Kick off your summer with Alberta Blue Cross and Silverberg Group's Street Eats Festival on Saturday, June 15th, beginning at 11 a.m. at the NMAX Centre parking lot. Enjoy delicious and unique food truck cuisines, a kid zone, entertainment and an eating contest. This event is in support of Lethbridge Family Services. For more information, visit lfsfamily.ca. Devil's Cooley Dinosaur and Heritage Museum, located in Warner, Alberta, is now open until September 2nd. Take a tour of the Dinosaur Gallery, Heritage Exhibits and Military Displays. Visit Charlie the Baby Dinosaur, dig in a simulated bone bed, and see an actual nesting site. For more information, visit devilcooley.com. And that's your Bridge City News Community Calendar. Universities were for many years known to be the places where free thought and speech were championed. Vigorous debates on controversial topics were welcomed and expected. Today, the opposite seems to be true. Controversial opinions are not always welcome. Our guests today have some very strong opinions on this. John Carpe is president of the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms and Catherine Furukawa, one of our regular BCN contributors. Welcome both to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. John, the good news is that our new Alberta government has made a pledge to hold public universities responsible for protecting free expression on campus. But will they face a lot of opposition to this from student unions and maybe some of the teacher faculties? I think they'll face some opposition from some people, but uh, by and large the taxpayers and I think most students on campus uh, would be pleased to see some legislation in place to protect campus free speech and to hold universities accountable to fulfilling their own mission. Now, can you give us some examples of how universities really shut down free speech on controversial issues? Well, we saw at the University of Alberta in uh, 2015, uh, some, a small campus pro-life club put up a stationary display and it was surrounded by a loud chanting mob uh, holding up sheets and towels and making it impossible for any debate or conversation to take place. And even though this was clearly contrary to the university's own rules, the university took no disciplinary action against any of the students. Uh, a few years earlier, we had a similar problem, a pro-life club at the University of Calgary with the campus administration th threatening to expel them for doing nothing other than simply expressing their views peacefully on campus. So university presidents are failing to stand up for free speech and the Justice Centre has presented model legislation, proposed legislation to the Legislative Assembly and asked them to adopt a law that is going to require universities to actually uphold free speech on campus or else face uh, some hefty fines. Did you or any of your family members run into issues when it came to free speech at a post-secondary institution, Catherine? My sister right now is actually at the University of Regina. 
um, and has encountered this a couple of times, she said, in class, where she'll maybe offer an opposing view, maybe a more conservative viewpoint, and is immediately shut down and not always, but often not encouraged to share her point of view that's differing from professors, from classmates, and yeah, hasn't had that opportunity to share as you would, as other groups maybe are. So it's impacted your family personally then, yeah. right? Now John, to support the Alberta government pledge, the Justice Centre has submitted a policy paper to the Legislative Assembly. Can you give us a brief outline of your suggestions? Yes, we suggest to the Legislative Assembly to pass a law that defines what free speech is and is not on campus. So for example, to heckle and disrupt and physically obstruct somebody else's display is not bona fide exercise of free speech. Uh, the legislation would also empower the Minister of Advanced Education to levy fines up to $50,000 for first offence in cases where universities are allowing a mob to run wild and shut down a debate or a display or an event. And um, so we, we actually need legislation with some teeth in it that's going to hold universities accountable to the large sums of money that they are getting from taxpayers. Catherine, let me ask you something. Do you think 50K is enough of a fine, of a deterrent, or should we maybe think $100,000? I don't know. I guess it maybe depends on the institution. And I think if some personal responsibility was taken, not just by the university itself, but by those who are acting in a way that's not encouraging free speech, maybe it is enough. I don't know. John, what do you think, 50K, or should we go a little bit higher with that? Uh, on a second or third offense, it can go up to 100,000. So 50,000 is uh, the, the maximum for a first offense. But if a university continues to uh, disrespect free speech by allowing the disruption of events, by allowing hecklers to pull a fire alarm, uh, that sort of thing, if the government, if the university is not decisive against that. The other thing is that this law uh, prohibits universities from targeting innocent parties with hefty security fees. For example, the University of Alberta has um, told a campus pro-life group they cannot have a display on campus unless they pay $17,500 in security fees, which of course is completely unaffordable for the group. Uh, and what this law will do is make sure that universities uh, do not target the innocent because the people who should pay that security fee are the ones that are disrupting events and obstructing events and uh, organizing disruption on, on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Now, John, you say this freedom of speech legislation would actually help Alberta attract the brightest of scholars and researchers? Considering the abysmal state with uh, political correctness growing more and more, uh, universities like the University of Chicago that have taken a stance for free speech and against political correctness, uh, I think are going to attract good students. And I think the same would hold true of uh, the universities in Alberta. You know, I simply don't understand why any self-respecting university would be afraid to allow politically incorrect speech on campus. Is it not about creating a discussion? Catherine, what do you think? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I understand that there's a difference between an opinion and facts that are potentially being presented by professors in class, but certainly I think that that's how we grow and we learn when we're able to share our opinion, hear somebody else's opinion. Um, it teaches us empathy and understanding, and I think it's so important in our post-secondary inst institutions to have that freedom of speech. Catherine, you're a mom. You've got two girls, age five and three. Are you concerned as well about their freedom of speech once they reach the university and college campus age? Absolutely. I mean, they are being currently being raised in a faith-based home uh, with some conservative perspectives, and it seems that often those are the groups that are not being allowed to share their opinions, and we're trying to teach them to be open to what other people have to say, and I think that if that's not reciprocated to them, for sure, as a mama bear, I would not be very happy to hear that that was going on um, while they're at university or college or wherever they go to study. 
John, still on the topic of freedom of speech, pro-life film unplanned is not receiving any major distribution here in Canada, so people are not even getting a chance to see it. The film is based on the true story of Abby Johnson and how she went from being the director of Planned Parenthood to being someone who now fights for the unborn. Is this not censorship if we can't see the movie here in our own country? It is censorship, but not on the part of government and not in a way that makes it impossible to see the film. I, I think it's disappointing in a way that the movie theaters are quite selective in who feels offended by what. Uh, there's all kinds of films that come out that would be very offensive to people of faith. And movie theater, if it got complaints, would just shrug its shoulders. And here is a film that's going to be offensive to those who have uh, strongly pro-choice views on abortion. Uh, fortunately, it's not government that is doing the censoring, so we're not at risk of, of getting fined or having to spend time in jail for, uh, for viewing the film or for distributing it. And there's ways to bypass the movie theater. I mean, this, uh, this movie could you know, potentially go on to Netflix or other online sources, some kind of pay-for-view type of uh, scenario. So it's going to be next to impossible to fully censor the film. People who want to see it will be able to see it. And the producers of the film would be able to use alternative technology, even though it's not being shown in, in theaters. It also occurs to me that a large churches, uh, like you know Calgary, Edmonton, other cities have big churches, could have a screening for you know one, two, 3,000 people. Uh, so that also is a possibility. We also chatted with the owner of the movie mill here in Lethbridge. It's an independent movie studio and he talked about potentially bringing unplanned to the movie mill as well so stay tuned we may have more details on that but Catherine how does that make you feel that the larger movie theaters are deciding what you can and cannot see I think it just comes back again to that is it is freedom of speech really free is it a select groups that get the right of freedom of speech and if so yeah it's not free and it's not fair, and I think it's definitely something that we need to be speaking up about and figuring out. John, let's switch up gears for just a moment here. You filed a court application on the behalf of two individuals and a business challenging a bylaw of the Municipal District of Foothills. This has to do with the large pro-life billboard signs on parked semi-trailers on the side of highways. I see them when I go out to Calgary all the time. Tell me more about that. Well, the Foothills Municipal District uh, has banned advertising on trailers, on private property, but at the same time, it allows Patterson signs and other commercial signs, some of which are very bright, very colorful, electronic signs with a rotating display. And I think the, uh, I think the municipal district has to you know, think through, uh, if this is really dangerous for driving, if it's dangerous for distracting drivers, maybe we should pass a law banning all signs, or conversely, if it's not dangerous, uh, if it's not causing a significant distraction, maybe we should allow all signs. But what the municipal district is doing is targeting uh, signs on trailers on private property, but allowing um, companies like Patterson to put up much brighter and bolder signs along the side of the highway highways. So it's an untenable double standard and we believe that it, it violates the free expression guarantee of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Yeah, because I mean, as a landowner, this is my private property. Let's say if you own that property, Catherine, out in the country, don't you feel you have the right to put whatever you wanted on your own property? Absolutely. I was actually just talking to somebody about this with the election who said, well, everybody in my community has signs up that are different than mine. I don't want to offend them. And the conversation went, well, what about all your neighbors potentially offending you by their choice of sign? I mean, it is your right on your property to right. display your opinion, I guess, as long as you do it in a respectful mm -hmm. manner. And So, John, is there any particular bylaw specifically aimed at pro-life signs? And if so, would it be helpful for concerned citizens to contact their municipal district councillors and let them know how they really feel about this? Oh, absolutely. People should call their elected representatives. Uh, it's too bad that a law has to be taken to court, but it's the politicians themselves that can amend the law, and they can do so quite easily. And it's not, and it's not about the, well, 
probably the expression is being targeted because it's pro-life, but we don't really know that for sure. But apart from the pro-life advertising that uh, is on some of these trailers, the, the bigger issue is a double standard. Either the signs distract drivers and perhaps we should ban all of them, or they're not dangerous and we allow all of them, but politicians can correct the current problem, which is to allow the bright electronic commercial Patterson signs while going after uh, private landowners. Let's squeeze in one more here. You've also asked that the provincial government repeal a gag law that the NDP put in place, which severely restricts third party political advertising. What are the problems with this gag law? Gag law forces nonprofit groups to publicly post the name, the names of uh, their donors and where their donors live. So if a group like, uh, say, Parents for Choice in Education wanted to run some uh, radio ads informing the public about, uh, you know, what's wrong with the uh, parent secrecy laws that, you know, require uh, teachers, teachers and principals to withhold parents, uh, withhold secrets from parents about their own kids. If Parents for Choice in Education wanted to run uh, those ads, they would have to list or they would have to tell Elections Alberta and Elections Alberta would list on its website the names of anybody giving $250 or more towards the advertising campaign. What that does is it severely violates the privacy rights of citizens to be able to support the cause of their own choice, but not necessarily be public about it in the same way that we have a secret ballot and we don't have to disclose publicly who you vote for. Uh, because if we did, it could lead to intimidation and uh, bullying and all kinds of problems. So uh, hopefully a new government will repeal these gag law provisions that uh, uh, hamper grassroots organizations from running advertising campaigns. Catherine, let me ask you as a concerned citizen, would, would you feel that be a violation of your rights? 100%. I mean, I don't show you my bank statement. Why? Like, this is no different, like, as far as I'm concerned, so. So, John, what kind of response are you getting from the government so far on your policy papers? Well, it's just been in the last 10 days that we have uh, submitted the two different papers, so no response yet. Uh, but there are private members who are looking at putting bills forward, and uh, they now have at least two more options to, uh, to consider, and as does the government as well, because the government will be bringing forth a lot of legislation as well, starting on Tuesday, May 21st. John Carpe, President of the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms and BCN contributor Catherine Furukawa, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Lethbridge and Southern Alberta have been struggling with a crisis of opioid addiction, which is destroying so many lives. Various levels of government are doing their part to try and find solutions. But what role should the church be playing in all of this? Our guest today may have some solutions for us. Bill Zwartbull is the executive director of Love Lethbridge and pastor of Free Grace Fellowship, and he joins me in studio. Bill, welcome to BCN. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to be here. You bet. Now, first of all, what is Love Lethbridge all about? Love Lethbridge is, uh, consists of, um, of business leaders and pastors with the, the motivator for the church to serve the city in practical ways, specifically in the, in the area of social needs or social injustices. So we seek to bring the government together, uh, the business community together, and the church and together to network to address these issues. Okay, let's talk about, speaking of the issues, the opioid crisis in our city and across the province. Bill, some people say, leave it with the hands of the government. They know what they're doing. But you say, you know what? Maybe the church should be involved as well. Tell me a bit about that. Well, if we're going to stand on the Word of God, which is our foundation, we've got to consider who is responsible for these social issues. Uh, the government has no mandate from God to address them initially or, pr or primarily. It's the role of the church. Now, you also have a prayer group in Lethbridge that's specifically praying for those who are addicted in our city with the opioid crisis. How does that look? Well, it's, uh, it flows out of Lethbridge House of Prayer, which actually prays for a lot of things in the community and churches. So one of the, one of the focuses they have is they give a prayer covering for any developments or things we're involved in. So if something is being established or done out of Love Lethbridge, we let, the, we, we let uh, its leader know. If there is things regarding the opioid issues, we let them know, and we have 
their covering along the way. What kind of an impact can prayer really have, practically speaking, in the lives of those who were addicted? Well, if, for, from a distance perspective, uh, if you, if you uh, the leader of Lethbridge House of Prayer is Jennifer. So she, for instance, every Monday morning, they and some, some of her team goes to Streets Alive. They've been doing this for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. They can now statistically show you the differences made before they've come in and what they're doing now. Uh, on a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, there's always an impact, more of the, of the, you know, of the personal, of the personal um, effects of people. And you, sometimes you see the change happen in front of you. Now, you've been involved with the Fort McLeod Detox Center. Share a bit with our viewers how that's been looking. Okay, so we had a story that was shared at a Lima executive, so, so the, the ministerial, about an individual looking for help, calling the Alberta Helpline, and uh, the final response was anything but doable or reasonable. So I felt a nudge in my spirit of, does the church want to know? And I raised a question around the table, which ended up in a roundtable discussion at a ministerial meeting, from which formed a committee of interested parties, leaders, to consider what possibly we can do. In the process, one of our members uh, of, on the committee went to see the detox center and said, what are you all about, what do you do, et cetera, which opened up an opportunity for us to go in there now and minister to the people firsthand and uh, to seek to see their lives changed. That's wonderful. Now, how about getting involved with some of the other churches in town? What kind of support have they shown you as well in regards to the opioid crisis, how they can help? Right, so they see me as the uh, representative of the faith, at least the evangelical faith community, regarding this issue in the city. And in turn, the city, for at City Hall, they see me again as the face of the, face of the faith community. And so they give verbal support, they, uh, I give them updates, and they're very much on board. Um, yet not many of them have come on board or jumped on board and said, how can we get involved? There's been more individuals, uh, whether it's just people in the churches and some leaders. Why do you think that is? There's not that level of commitment maybe you're hoping for. Uh, so we have a buy-in, so mm -hmm. and, and it's more than lip service, but because of the leader's mandate they have, mm -hmm. um, there's pastors whose mandate does not go beyond the church walls. There's others who have a God-given mantle to go beyond into the community, and I, I do believe God has given me that. So for some, it's not something they feel they should take on, and for others, they probably have enough... Um, time commitments where they can't give it time even if they wanted to. Are you involved with Teen Challenge as well, who also help people that struggle with addictions in our city? I am. I've been involved with Teen Challenge for probably 10 years, at least 10 years. And one of the reasons is we have a few men in our church who've gone through the program and who are very much involved in Teen Challenge. So by default, I'm, I'm connected. They've been in our church and, uh, and done their fundraisers and, and awareness, participate in their golf tournament every year. But also, I've, I stay connected and ask them the questions, what is the need in addition to rehab like Teen Challenge? And so we've had conversations around that, and which has helped in, to, to bring some clarity in my mind, what is the current need, what are the needs that maybe are not being addressed very well? Um, and that came out of a conversation with Teen Challenge. Now, Lethbridge has a safe consumption and injection site in Arches. Yes. Have you ever had an opportunity to reach out to maybe some of the organizers of Arches, talk about some of the programs and how maybe you can help, even from a spiritual side? Yes. So we, when the city became aware we were meeting around this topic, they invited us to one of their meetings in the, in the Culver Room at City Hall. And they wanted to know what we were doing, and they shared what they were doing. And they encouraged us to stay connected, not become too isolated. And in turn, they invited us for a tour through the supervised consumption site. And so a few, some months later, when things were more settled down and organized there, we took a tour and we saw firsthand what goes on there. And since then, I've seen statistics. And uh, yeah, so I have, I have a, a level of awareness uh, of the need and what's going on. So explain to our viewers what you really share with recovering addicts to help steer them down the right path, Bill. Well, for instance, when we go to the, to the DDoc Center, we are now participating in the programming. We are one of the groups that, that come in there on a regular basis, and we have like one hour to meet with them. So you know you're not going to get into the deep issues. You're not going to open up the can of worms because you can't put the lid back on in an hour. But what almost all of them have in common is a low self-esteem, uh, huge issues, hurt, hurt issues that have probably not been resolved, broken relationships, and a lot of shame and guilt. 
Is it a lot of escapism for them then at the same time? That's why they're using drugs to escape from a lot of the issues, the Absol hurt, absolutely. and a lot of the problems? Absolutely. So do you have a chance to maybe sit down with them and pray with them one-on-one? -on -one? What we offer is, so we go in for an hour, we give from, from, on a Tuesday morning from 10 to 11, and then we have up to an hour till lunchtime to, to do one-on-one -on -one ministry if they so desire. So they are required to be there for the hour, and beyond that, it's voluntary. So for instance, I was there last week, and there was 11 in the room, uh, the hour was up, and three left, and eight stayed behind. And I, I had opportunity to minister to a number of them, one-on-one, -on -one, um, but even the one-on-one, -on -one, the others wanted to see what was going on. And so we have this little, little opportunity to minister to them in ways that goes beyond the physical and even the emotional. So what do you see are some of the major underlying roots of the addictions from those you've talked to and prayed with? Almost consistently, abuse. Right and broken relationships. Like and marriages, it's maybe, maybe with their mothers and fathers, they had a terrible relationship? Yes, or lack of them. You know, in, right. the, in the foster care system, some of them, they, they, you know, they, they've lost a spouse in a fire or something like that, and this, it has devastated them. Um, there was one case, he um, had cancer, got treated, got addicted to the prescribed drug, and that was his journey into, into, um, into drugs. You know, I've talked to seniors as well who suffer from chronic pain, fibromyalgia, and they get addicted as well to opioids because the doctors only give them so much, but the pain continues, so then they reach out and they need more of the opioids to help them, and they get addicted to the drugs as well. So it's not just young people, but seniors are also addicted. Absolutely. We see all, you know, for instance, in the, again, the detox or arches, uh, you see, we see all ages. Although the, the average, for instance, for arches or the, the supervised consumption site, mm -hmm. the, the, the highest percentage is between, somewhere between 20 and 35. That would be the, the, the highest numbers of, for the age group. So Bill, in your thoughts, what seems to enable people to help break that addiction, that nasty, vicious cycle of being addicted to opioids? Well, like in all things in life, um, one, one, one that typically helps people to look for help is when they hit rock bottom. That's, when you see that, they're in a good place because now they're ready for help. Another big one is trust. For instance, one of the topics I bring is honesty, getting honest with yourself, and I go into the area of trust. Who do you trust? And trust is a very big issue, and so how do you build trust? It takes time. So if they can actually trust somebody, now they're willing to open up and share a little bit and some of the pains come out, the hurts come out, and you can begin to walk with them. But most of them, though they lean on each other, being in that world, yet they trust nobody but themselves. Do you ever run into an issue where people who are addicted to drugs push you away and say, you know what, you're a Christian, you're going to judge me, get lost. I don't want any part of this. You and your God are going to judge me. There are some of those. Um, there was an individual recently who was, he, he, had just, he had just come in, it was his first day into detox. He was very angry, mm -hmm. angry at God, and it's typically around God could have prevented this. You know, he, he's unfair. And uh, so they're looking for somebody to blame for their problem, and sometimes it comes through other Christians. What other Christians have said, whether meaning they are well-meaning or whether they are actually have, have stated in a way that is, that is hurtful no matter who, 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 who they faced. Uh, so yes, Christians have hurt them, but sometimes it has nothing to do with Christians, but they know God exists, and this is my lot in life, so God is a vicious God. So how can you really help people on the road to recovery? After they've gone through the program, successfully beat their addiction, what's next for them? It's really a new life, it's a new beginning, isn't it? It, it is a new beginning, so our long-term vision or focus for, you know, we have the opportunity at the detox is, re, is, um, is transition. So even after they come out of rehab, how do they transition back into society? Some of them have become institutionalized, even in rehab. Some are, have no way, they have never lived in what we, we would call a normal lifestyle. They don't know what it means to have wholesome relationships. They don't know what it means to hold down a job. They don't know what it means to balance the budget. They don't know what it means to put limitations on, 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 their, on their lives. And so without those kind of uh, safeguards, it's virtually, it's humanly impossible for them to really make it. So the God, the God factor and God's people is huge. So what models are used in other cities successfully that we can maybe implement here in Lethbridge? 
or Fort McLeod for that matter? Well, I do believe that a rehabilitation center like, like Teen Challenge is a great start because it's the Jesus factor. The Spirit of God makes the difference in your and my life and can make a difference in their lives. However, it doesn't mean they won't stumble and fall. And so, like the body of Christ, we need one another. So what are some helps? Um, maybe I'm not the right person to speak into it. I haven't traveled to the cities, but I am still looking for where is a model that's working that we can duplicate or copy or take some, some principles from. I don't know that anyone does it well in the province in which we live. And I've talked to people in, in, in BC, I've talked to people in some of the states, and I, I, I look at the web and I'm, I'm continuing to search for, Lord, wh what is the blueprint? What is your solution for our problem here in Southern Alberta? What approach would you take to somebody, Bill, who may be of the Muslim faith, Sikh, a Buddhist, who may be struggling? You know, as opposed to somebody who may be, yeah, used to be Catholic, not a practicing Catholic, or maybe Christian, who's backslid. So how would you approach them? How would you approach them? Any differently? I would approach them um, probably the same way, but maybe not the, the offensive language to them. But to, to love your neighbor as yourself works everywhere. And so display the love of God. And um, if given an opportunity to pray for them in the name of Jesus and have them experience the power and presence of God that their own God has never been able to do for them. Now, programs like this, you need help, you need volunteers, financial help. Is there any way our viewers can help? Well, we have a support network already in place for people who leave detox who want help. But we're, we're currently having a difficult time because, for instance, the, an individual told me last week, it's like picking up a thousand pound phone to make that call. Because I know that's a good thing for me to do, but I don't dare. Um, so prayer, yes. Uh, Prayer covering is huge. It's not just a cliche, it is huge. For us to break through, we have to first break through in the spirit. Um, other ways, we will need a volunteer base when we begin to establish our, um, our transition network. We actually want to see a, uh, a location established where we can catch people that, that are ready to go to detox, but they can't get in when they got it. They want to go to rehab and that there's a waiting list. So, so where should people go for more information if they want to help out? So currently we have, a, have an email address. It's, it's Hope Initiative, so H-O-A-P, Holistic Opioid Absence Program. So hopeinitiative at gmail.com. Bill Zwartbull, who is Executive Director of Love Lethbridge and Pastor of Free Grace Fellowship. Thanks so much for joining me in studio today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Summer will be here before you know it. And with that come summer camps for our kids. Joining me now in studio to chit-chat a bit about it is John Gartley, the Executive Director of Southern Alberta Bible Camp. Welcome to Bridge City News, John. Hey, thanks for having me, Al. So let's talk a bit about, like, I love summer camp when I was a kid. We had yeah. so much fun, archery, canoeing, all the hiking. What goes on with the Southern Alberta Bible Camp? Well, we're right on the Trevor's Reservoir. So it's a, there's a beautiful lake there. I mean, it was, the property was given to us in 1981 by the Ruggles family, and it, there's not a stick on it, but, but we have kids that come. They, uh, we run camps for 1,700 kids every summer. They come, they, they, they start on Sunday night, and they go, go till Friday night, and, uh, and they, they live in a cabin full of uh, eight kids their own age, and, and, um, and there's just, it's full of activities all week long. Now, you guys are located in Lomond, Alberta, not far yeah. from a lake there. So tell me about some of the fun marine activities that the kids partake in. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's, there's canoeing, fishing. I never would have thought it, but fishing is actually one of the favorite favorite skills there. I mean, what kind of fish? activities? Man, there's, I'm not a fisherman, <laughs> but Trout, there's, salmon, uh, there, no, there's no salmon, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's perch out there, there's okay. walleye, there's, uh, yeah. there's, there's jackfish and, and uh, whitefish for sure. So, but it, you know, these kids, like they catch these fish and it's just that the, some of these kids, they never go fishing. And they come, they catch this fish, and it's unbelievable. Uh, we, we got a uh, partnership with Waterski Wakeboard Alberta, so we do walk, wait, water ski wakeboarding out there. Uh, we do uh, kayaking, canoeing, lots of swimming because it gets pretty hot out there, and uh, uh, we even do some sailing, sailing programs. So, I mean, a lot of our programs, it's kind of the centerpiece of the camp there is that lake is right there, and we just want to use it. It's just God-given, you know, like there it is. It's, it's amazing. 
Now, John, this is a Christian camp. Do you ever have non-Christian campers who come out as well? Yeah, so I have our 1,700 kids, fully, probably, um, well, I know two-thirds of our kids actually don't attend church on a regular basis, and fully a third um, don't attend church at all. And so they come to Southern Alberta Bible Camp. And, and it's a, a neat opportunity that we have because I... Uh, you know, I mean, we're very clear on what our mission is. We, we want to have a lot of fun with the kids, and, and uh, we want to have, do all these activities that we I explained before, but we also want to share the gospel. So it's an opportunity that we can share the gospel with every kid that comes. And um, I don't know, it's neat to see the Lord change lives through that. So how about some of the kids that maybe are raised in Hindu homes, Muslim homes, or Buddhist homes? Yeah. Have they ever attended? Well, it's well? funny. I had a, story, I had a, a call from a a parent from, from, from Calgary who phoned me, he said his, his daughter had been invited to come to this Southern Alberta Bible Camp by a friend. And, and he said, what is this about? Like, you're a Bible camp? It was very clear on what it is. And so I was able to talk about who Jesus was and that he came and he died on the cross for our sins. It's all written in the Bible. He rose again and that we might be saved. And he said, that's the message we share. You know, we, we don't get into a lot of the details about the differences, in, but we just want to share who, about the, this person of Jesus. And you know, the guy... On the other end of the line, he just kind of said, hmm, sounds like a pretty good message. I think I'm going to send my kid to camp. So, wow, yeah, that's it's tremendous. Kind of, yeah. So yeah. tell me about some of the kids' lives that have been changed by attending the camp and gave their lives to Christ. Yeah. Well, it's a story I've been telling recently, I, I actually just heard it I, about a month ago, was a few, a number of years ago, these, uh, these two kids, um, siblings, came to camp. And through that week, they became, you know, through hearing the gospel message or the campfires or whatever, they became Christians. And they went home, and uh, their dad overheard them praying in their room, Lord, please help my parents to become Christians. And so he was a little bit upset about this because he, uh, he didn't really know like, what kind of indoctrination this camp did with their kids. Like, what are they praying? I'm fine, you know. But he made the decision in his head that he was going to figure out who this Jesus was. And so through whatever, through his friends and he, he, he did some, you know, he, he did some seeking about who Jesus was. He became a Christian himself. And the later part of the story is that he actually mentored a, another individual who became a pastor in a, in a church in one of our Southern Alberta churches. So it's kind of neat. Yeah. Now, you've been involved with the Southern Alberta Bible Camp for about 28 years now? 28 years, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Over those years, did you ever receive pushback from parents who were non-believers, saying, my kid came home and they're brainwashed, I'm not happy? Anything like that? Do you ever receive anything like no. that? No. No? I... You know, we're a Bible camp, mm -hmm. and and that's what we are. We're not Southern Alberta camp, right? We're not a, uh, we're not trying to hide that piece of it. And so it's in our, it's on our web page, it's in all our writings, and and the the only pushback maybe, and this is what we train our staff is they can get some of our staff in the past is can get very zealous and very like very strong, you know, as far as this is you. Yeah. On fire uh, for the Lord, right? On fire for the Lord. And they, yeah. they've got good hearts, but it, the gospel just isn't presented in a very, wasn't presented in a very good way. So we spent a lot of time talking to our staff. Listen, like, these kids are coming from homes that, uh, I mean, they've, they've been brought up a certain way, and they're coming to us for a week. And so what are we going to do? What kind of memories are we going to pray? We, we give them, uh, like, we want to show them that they're loved. We want to tell them about Jesus who loves them unconditionally. Um, that he again and who, who he is and, and and introduce them to the Bible and what the Bible says and, but and then uh, um, stories from our own lives you know about how God changed our lives and and how he works in our lives and so we want those memories to go home with these kids that that yeah if if and they're going back to those homes right and so it's but it's a memory it's a seed that's planted and, and who knows down the road I mean um, so tell me about some of those kids then John yeah. who gave their lives to Christ at camp and they became a shining beacon on the hill for their families. Oh, man. You know? Well, that was one that I shared already. Right. Yeah. I mean, I got a good friend who's a pastor in, uh, in BC now, but he, he came as a kid. He had ADHD, and his, his mom wasn't going to give him any pills, and he said, go to camp. <laughs> so he came to camp, and he, he uh, came over so many years, and he just and he's been a blessing. He's been a blessing to to so many, he's a good friend, and now he's just doing amazing things in BC, in that church there, and, and telling other people about Jesus. So, uh, miss him, but he's a neat guy, so. Other than the spiritual growth, what other things are, are taught to the children at the camp, how they're able to maybe become more independent and mature? 
well, they, they got to go away from their mom and dad, right? And so for them to say goodbye, you know, sometimes we have to give counseling services to parents because it's almost harder for yeah. parents to let their kids go. But but it's it's neat to see these kids. They come. They're able to stay overnight uh, for f five nights. Um, um, they're able to build f for friendships there that they haven't had before, like new friendships and 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 develop relationships with adults that that are there that love them as well. And so, um, you know, there, there, there's there's issues there. They can't go to mom all the time, and so they've got to solve some of these problems themselves. But I mean, we do a lot of activities too. We do. Uh, I mean, like I said, water ski, wakeboard, Alberta. So it isn't just hey, get in a boat, get put some skis on, we'll see if you get up. We've got coaches that are trained to coach these kids how to ski. And and let's face it, like not a lot of people have their own boats, and so they come to camp. They learn how to ski. We get all those kids up, and they, they ski, some of them, for the very first time. Many of them come year after year. This one kid, like, he's a very good skier. And our boat driver asked him, like, well, you know, where do you ski? Like, do you ski and you get coached somewhere else? He says, I come here every summer. This is the only time I get to ski. And so he's, he's learned that skill, which, I mean, it's just a fun skill, right? But, but it's, it's something that he can... He can he, he can succeed at and do well at, and uh, it's, it's a great memory. And these camp counselors, they're all trained in the ladies with first aid? Yes, all of them. All of them have first aid. We have a full-time nurse that's there all through the summer. Okay. We have volunteer nurses as well. Uh, in fact, this summer we have a, a full-fledged paramedic that's there wow. this summer, all summer long. So, How, about, how does the camp really help the kids with their self-esteem, John? Well, you know, I... I think it's finding out who our identity is, you know? Like there's that verse, Psalm 139, 13, 14, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We're made by the creator of the universe. He made us, he formed us before we even like were born. And and helping kids to understand that. And it, it I mean, we get them for a week, right? But but knowing that they're loved, knowing that they're 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 created, special by the creator of the universe, knowing that, uh, I mean, these kind of things, uh, we really want them to know what their identity in Christ is, not just their identity and who they think they are. Right? One of the first camps I went to was in Kananaskis country. I had a lot yeah. of fun, you know, horseback riding. We did so much, but I got homesick. I got to tell you when I was little. Yeah. So how do you deal with that, with these children who've never been separated from their parents before? Yeah, we just, we lock them in a, in a room and we don't uh, deal with them for the week. <laughs> sure, yeah, okay. <laughs> As long no, as they have a Bible, that's the important thing. No, yeah. it's a uh, it's a real a real thing, and it's a real sickness. It's a, you talk about homesickness. It's sickness, and uh, again, our staff are trained to, to deal with that. We there's a lot. I mean, there's lots of tricks that we we do. We really work with parents, and so parents give us the kind of some help with that, and, sure. and we want to, to kind of get their their idea of their kids and what, what so you works want them to feel them. at home and comfortable, yeah. right? But kids. we sure don't tell them that their parents miss them, and we sure don't talk to them about their parents and what they do at home. We talk to them, mm -hmm. yeah. We try and keep their 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 um, um, just what they're thinking about to, to what's going to be going on throughout the week. And so, I mean, it doesn't happen. Not all kids stay there. Like, I mean, we maybe maybe one or two in a summer go home that, that just can't handle it, but. What kind of a cost is there involved with this? And do you provide financial assistance for families who may be underprivileged? Um, so about 400 bucks for a week at camp. Um, maybe what does that include? Touch under, everything. I mean, oh. sorry, I shouldn't say everything. Water ski, there'll be an extra charge for that, just for the, okay. for the gasoline, but, um, and for some of the coaching. There's a few things with some added costs, but, but if you wanted to come to camp and have a great, great, uh, maybe, maybe not you, but... <laughs> <laughs> you can come help. You can yeah, drive sure. boat. Yeah. But uh, to come, it's about 400 bucks. That includes all your food, housing, and, uh, and all the activities that uh, that's that a great provide. Deal. And so, and one of our values at the camp is that we we uh, that, that, that there's no child that will be not allowed to come because of finances, financial reasons. And so, we we, we uh, that's that's our board. That's that's something that that they've said. We don't want that to be an inhibitor to kids coming. And so. We've got fun set up. We've got actually a ride, a fundraising thing. Sorry for the shameless whatever, but it's next weekend. It's a ride for a reason. We're riding around Waterton, 120 kilometers on bicycles. And it raises money strictly 
to send kids to camp. And so last year, I think they raised a touch over $100,000. All that money oh. goes to send kids to camp. We send about, we sponsor about 400, touch over 400 kids in part normal. But we work with parents too. If they can't pay for the whole thing, well, what can you pay? You so know? what's the age range then for these kids that attend summer camp? Most of our camps are for um, grades two to six, but then we have an, an, a large number that are junior high. We have one camp for senior high. But our senior high students, we, we, we hire about 150 volunteers and in, um, in staff in the summer. And so those people, we try and slide into a, a, some kind of a role there, whether it's washing dishes or, you know, um, cleaning bathrooms or um, working in the kitchen or, or just uh, playing games with the kids. So there's so many opportunities for young people to do that. So there was some controversy last year, you may remember, with the federal government's summer jobs grant program. Yeah. You had to sign the attestation. You know, you either fall in line with what the Liberals' ideology is at that time, you know, yeah. you know standing up for LGBTQ2 plus rights, uh, you know, being pro-choice as well, with a woman's right to give an abortion, which nothing to do with a lot of businesses, but yeah. a lot of people, obviously with Christian organizations, had a problem with it. Mm -hmm. Did you sign that attestation last year? No, we, uh, we passed on that last year. And okay. uh, it was about a, you know, it was about a $35,000 hit on our budget. But, uh, you know, part of the thing is we, and I think I mentioned this last year was, we shouldn't, we shouldn't expect that money. We, we appreciate it. We appreciate the government. But you don't value. rely on it solely then, right? But, well, it was a, we budgeted for it because right. we figured we were going to get it. So it, it, was a, it was a little bit of a hit for us. But, uh, but, and it was, it was tough, the reason why we didn't get it. But you know what? A lot of our, some of our people stepped up and really helped us out, some generous people. And so we were able to cover that, that shortfall because of some donations of a few. And so this year we've applied again. And, well, they've toned, and, toned it down, right? Yeah, they've toned it right now. I think, right. I think that there's uh, a lot of backlash some, from Canadians. Maybe some common sense kind yeah. of prevailed, and, and I mean, and we appreciate it. Like we really do it. We we get to hire some really quality young people. We, I I say this over and over. When we run our programs, we can have a good camp if we have good staff, but we can have great camps if we run we'll hire great staff. And so that's that's our bar. We're trying to hire great staff, and how. And allowing us to pay them is, helps us with that as well. So most how do parents most of our staff are volunteers. So. Oh, they are? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. tremendous. So, John, how do parents register their children for these uh, it's online. camps? Online, www.sabc.ca. So, and there's a registration process there. If you have any problems with that or you're, you need help, just phone our office and we'll help you. Love to have your kids in. John Gartley, who's the Executive Director for Southern Alberta Bible Camp, thanks a lot for joining me in studio today. No problem. Thank you. And behalf of all of us here at BCM, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great night.